My name is Justin Lloyd. My name is Justin Gross. I'm Alana Goldberg, and I'm Sophia E. And our project is fabricating and characterizing polymers. Our presentation will begin with some background on the equipment and materials that we use. Next, we will state the techniques that we use with the various machines, then we'll discuss the data and its meaning for the future. Polymers are basically long chains of repeated units called monomers. They're high masses and their chemical properties make them ideal for usage with other polymers. And uh, this mixing of polymers can create new substances with a desired uh, set of characteristics. Uh, so the polymer that we study is called poly -L lactide It's a naturally synthesized polymer from corn and sugar cane. It's highly biodegradable as well. And although it has been around for several decades, it's recently gained popularity for its usage in the biomedical industry, especially as a substitute material for um, usage in bone pins and sutures. Uh, so the first technique we used for characterization was X-ray diffraction. And X-ray diffraction places a sample on a stage and puts it under an X-ray beam. And a detector is able to detect the angles at which the sample diffracts the X-rays. And using this, in conjunction with a mathematical relationship called Bragg's Law, we're able to determine the molecular structure. Um, and this is a commonly used technique that's used for many polymers. And the second uh, characterization technique we use is called differential scanning calorimetry. Uh, calorimetry measures the change in heat flow as you change the temperature. And uh, this differential scanning calorimetry is unique in that it compares two samples. And so you have a control sample and your experimental sample. And using that, you're able to determine thermal properties such as heat of fusion, heat of vaporization, fast transition, and specific heat. And this has applications in pharmaceutical, biomedical engineering, and plastics. So our first step was to evaluate the thermal properties of our polymer. Um, so if you look here on the left, you can see our polymer PLLA in semi-crystalline powder form. Um, to analyze it, we first prepared a sample by placing some of the polymer into the pan as shown on the right. And we placed the sample in the pan in the differential scanning calorimeter. And um, it went through three cycles. First uh, was heating, then cooling, and then another reheating cycle. And um, we were able to get a plot of the um, exothermic and endothermic energy of the sample um, as it was as it was being heated or um, cooled. So our next step was to fabricate um, our polymer. So we use a single screw extruder um, to fabricate fibers and rods. If you take a look at the picture on the top left, um, this is the extruding machine. And we first put the polymers in the cone at the top, and um, the screw would bring the polymer down into the, um, into the extruding machine, and um, heat and pressure will be applied to make it a more viscous material. And you can see in the picture on the right that a, rod is, a PLA rod is being extruded. And um, the pictures on the bottom shows the two dies that we use on the extruder. So the one on the right has a smaller hole, which we used for fiber, fiber fabrication. And the one on the left is for rod fabrication. Um, we made five different thicknesses of fibers by drawing the filament out at different speeds. And um, for rods, it was the same process, except we didn't draw it out. And um, after we produced fibers and rods, we annealed samples of, bulk, um, of all the types of um, materials and uh, we did so by heating it to 150 degrees Celsius and then letting it cool slowly for increased reorganization. Um, so we had two, two main characterization tests, the first of which was fiber tensile testing. Um, we tested both unannealed and annealed versions of fiber 4 and fiber 5. Uh, the way that we prepared the sample was that we took a piece of the, a small piece of the fiber and we glued it onto a cardboard frame, uh, which was then mounted onto the fiber, um, the tensile tester in the grips, and we made two cuts on the cardboard, which would allow the machine to only stretch the fiber. And um, the 
the fiber would be stretched until it broke. So our second characterization test was X-ray diffraction. So uh, using X-ray diffraction, we can uh, evaluate the structure and um, degree of crystallinity of the various samples. So if we want, we wanted to compare some different uh, categories of samples, such as annealed fibers versus unannealed fibers, and uh, thin fibers versus thicker fibers versus even thicker rods. And um, anneal both unannealed and annealed stretch and not stretch uh, fibers that we got from the tensile testing. And lastly, we also wanted to take a look at what a fiber annealed fiber will look like from different views. So we did x-ray diffraction from both a perpendicular angle to the fiber and also along the fiber axis. And this is just an example of um, how we did x-ray diffraction. Um, so this here is like the cardboard frame um, where these the fiber is still mounted and um, to its left is the x-ray tube where the x-ray is shot out and um, as it's scattered, the detector on the right picks it up and analyzes. So the first test we did was differential scanning calorimetry. Um, the first curve shown in red um, is the first heating curve. You can see at region B it's flat which shows that there's no significant evidence of water in the sample. At region C it melts um, and then the second curve is the cooling curve in blue. And at region H, it goes from a molten amorphous into a glass. And finally, the third curve um, is the second heating curve. It goes from um, 25 degrees Celsius to 250 degrees Celsius. At region L, it changes from a glass into a crystal. And at region N, it undergoes a molecular reorganization as shown by the exothermic curve. And then at region P, it melts, but you can see it melts at a lower temperature this time as compared to the first heating curve. And this is because the crystal is not as pure as the original crystal. So we created five fibers um, of different diameters, fiber one being the thickest and fiber five having the thinnest diameter. And then we annealed fiber 1, 4, and 5 to 150 degrees Celsius to change the structure. We had multiple samples for each, um, each type of fiber that we did tensile testing on. So this is a typical tensile test result for unannealed fiber 4. Um, on the right, sorry, on the y-axis, you can see the stress, the tensile stress that was exerted on the fiber in millipascals. And uh, on the x-axis, you see the percent strain of the original length of the fiber. And the rightmost point here would be the breaking point of the fiber. Um, so from this graph, you can kind of see that um, the fiber broke almost when it stretched to almost 10% of its uh, original length. And here is a typical um, result for the annealed fiber form. Sample, um, you can see that it's much more ductile because it broke when it stretched to over 160% of its original length. And this is just a comparison of the two when put on the same. So the next um, characterization test we did was X ray diffraction. And we noticed that our samples were either amorphous or crystalline. Um, all the annealed all the unannealed samples were amorphous while the annealed samples were crystalline, which led us to conclude that annealing a sample crystallized it. So this is the x-ray diffraction scan of um, unannealed fiber 1, which is again amorphous, and the ring is created by the 2 theta angle of the x-ray. And you can see that this fiber is amorphous because of the thick, blurred orange regions. Um, it's not defined because the atomic planes, there is no periodicity within the atomic planes, which just creates the blurred region. And here's the corresponding um, X-ray diffraction plot. Um, you can see again that it's amorphous because the peak width is very broad, um, whereas if it was more crystalline, there would be more peaks and there would be narrow um, intensities along 
the y-axis. So, um, so um, for the annealed samples, again, they're all crystalline, um, but they they were either isotropic or anisotropic. Um, isotropic means that um, the molecules were the planes were random, um, whereas in an anisotropic um, fiber, the the planes were oriented. So all of the annealed fibers, except for fiber one and the annealed rod, um, were anisotropic, while um, fiber one and the annealed rods were um, isotropic. And this is because fiber one and the rod were thicker, which gives more space for random orientation. So here's an X-ray diffraction scan of annealed fiber one, which is isotropic. Um, you can see by the uh, thin narrow orange bands that it's crystalline and because the bands are continuous um, it's an indication that it's isotropic. So this is annealed fiber 2 um, which is also crystalline but it's different because the bands are broken up and it's not continuous and this is because it's anisotropic. And here's the um, corresponding plot um, of annealed fibers one and two, and you can see the difference from the amorphous plot because the, the peaks are um, narrow and there's many more peaks of high intensity. So because anisotropic fibers are oriented, um, the pattern is different in different directions. So we decided to test this by doing an x-ray diffraction scan of annealed fiber four, which is anisotropic to see the difference when orienting the x-rays in different directions. So on the left, um, we oriented the x-rays perpendicular to the fiber, whereas on the right, um, the x-ray was oriented along the axis of the fiber. And you can clearly see the difference in the two scans. The last thing we did with x-ray diffraction was we took um, unannealed and annealed fiber 5 and we did a scan before and after it was stretched with the tensile test to see if stretching changed the structure at all and on the bottom is the plot of um, unannealed fiber 5 before and after stretching. Um, the green curve is before it was stretched while the black curve is after it stretched and you can see the, stru the um, structure is almost identical. The only difference is that um, before it was that um, after being stretched it's less intense but this is most likely due to the fact that when you stretch it there's less sample area and so it gives it less intensity. After analyzing the data we were able to determine that the that the annealed fibers and the crystallinity enhance the material <coughs> characteristics of the polymer. Greater crystallinity resulted in a higher modulus elasticity and higher level of tensile strength. However, stretching the, the fiber did not change the molecular structure because the, it was only a physical change and not a chemical. In the future, we'd like to, we also could perform stress testing upon the PLA rods to determine how the thickness affects the material properties of the polymer. We could also perform further testing upon the PLA fibers to maximize the tensile strength by determining the correct level of crystallinity. We would also like to determine if there's a relationship between biodegradability and and crystallinity. Finally, we'd like to determine if copolymerization or mixing two polymers has any effect upon the molecular strength and, and its structure. We would like to thank our mentors, Dr. Thomas MJ and Dr. Sanjeeva Murphy, and our RTA, Tara Nealon, for the guidance throughout this project. We'd also like to thank the directors, Eileen Rosen and John Patrick Antoine for organizing this program. Finally, we'd like to thank the sponsors for their support and making this program possible. Thank you.
So for our everyday use, what kind of glass is common? Is it available or like <laughs> in all kind of home, like window glass? What kind of the large process of this panel, something processor? Are you talking about, well, for window glass, it wouldn't be this material, but yeah, depending. Yeah, kind of material? Um, this PLA material, polyethyl lactic acid, currently, um, well, in biomedical fields, it's usually used as like sutures or bone pins. Um, like, because it's biodegradable, it's useful, like, when you're doing surgery, you don't want to have a material being, like, kept in your body for so long. And, um, so, yeah, I think, yeah. PLA isn't usually used in like everyday applications like windows and stuff. That would be um, like a different type of material. So. Although like you can have certain polymers, like a pretty similar polymer like polyethylene is what's used in uh, Kevlar, which is like a bulletproof. So there are polymers that are like pretty high strength depending on like if you kneel it or uh, what temperatures you create it under, but regular window glass, you're probably not going to need that high of a strength, so I don't think you would need it. Uh, PLA is also used in some forms of rapid prototyping with 3D printing because of its biodegradability as opposed to ABS plastic <coughs> and other uh, petroleum-based polymers. Are there any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.